Welcome back to another Q&A episode of Deal on the Cards. This week's episode, we'll talk about Bloom's impact on hitting development and what we believe he can actually do to overhaul the system. Do we believe the Cardinals will spend once again once they have overhauled their farm system? And out of the veterans that could be traded this offseason, are there any that the Cardinals should keep? And is there a world where next year they could be competitive with some of the right tweaks and changes to the Major League roster? We'll talk about all this and more on this episode of Deal on the Cards. Hey, it's Josh again here, back with another weekly Q&A episode. Um, again, we do these every single week, so if you comment on our previous Q&A episode, or I guess this one for this next week's episode, uh, let us know what kind of questions and topics you want us to address on here. Again, we always try to talk about those things on the podcast, but this gives us a very specific opportunity to address very specific questions just from our perspective, right? Um, again, you'll get a variety of perspectives from a variety of Cardinal content creators and such. And so, um, but we just think this is a fun community spot and we've appreciated the support so far. So like, and subscribe helps the channel out a ton. Again, comment down below um, your thoughts and response to some of my thoughts on this and then questions for next time. And we'll try to get to some of those. We usually try to do ones that um, we feel like we haven't addressed specifically on the podcast, but then we also want to dive deeper into ones that it feels like you guys are interested in. So thumbs up other comments if you're like, hey, I want to hear that too. Um, but again, um, like the channel um, or like the episode and subscribe to the channel helps out a ton. But the first question today is really interesting. And there's actually a really good write up by Baseball America that addresses part of this. Um, so I want to get into this one first. And it says, how do you think Bloom's presence will help the young bats develop? Can he save Walker and Gorman? Well, again, we know that Heim Bloom's uh, first year fully on the job in the front office is going to be focused uh, entirely on player development. Again, I do believe, but I mean, remains to be seen that he will speak into Major League Baseball decisions. Um, Mose Alex already talked about how he'll be looped into things that affect him beyond 2025. But in all reality, most moves affect you beyond the current season. So I do think he's going to have influence and say on those. But I think the main thing is he's not going to have to be like the one who initiates that stuff or thinks about it constantly. He just kind of gets to give his stamp of approval. But um, with how flawed player development seems to have been with the St. Louis Cardinals in recent years, it's encouraging that someone with such expertise in that area is going to take a full year after doing a full year audit. So he doesn't have to come in and go like, what are they doing wrong? He already knows that they're doing wrong. Now he gets a full year to implement those changes before taking over the whole operation. So again, I'm of the opinion I'd like to see him take charge right away. But now that we know this is the world they're working in, it is encouraging to think that, okay, he's going to get his hands on the organization for a full year. So how can he help with hitting development specifically? How can he help save, quote unquote, a Jordan Walker, a Nolan Gorman? And here's a couple ways. First of all, um, He's already identified where they are lacking in many areas, which includes things like significantly understaffed in their player development partner department when it comes to coaches, analytics department, all those types of things. So I think, first of all, if he's truly getting the money, that sounds like he's going to be getting from Bill DeWitt Jr. to um, invest in player development. You're going to see more coaches hired, which means more one-on-one -on -one work and more expertise with those young hitters. Again, from minor league level up to the major leagues, I don't think they're going to forsake Jordan Walker and Nolan Gorman because, oh, they're at the major leagues. Like, I think they're going to expand that coaching staff, but they're also going to have some roving instructors that will mostly be at the minor leagues, but I I'm sure are going to make their way up to the major leagues because part of their roles is like, it's not just that the, this is the only guy in the organization who works with outfielders or catchers, but they also make sure that every single level is aligned in what they're teaching and helping develop those players into so that you don't have a guy get promoted from single A to double A and they're teaching differently and not handling it the same. They're trying to provide some continuity um, so that the development is really uniformed in a, in a it, but also personalized each player, but, um, but it's done correctly, I guess is what I should say. But the um, thing I referenced earlier from Baseball America, this article came out October 11th and it's by Alex Speer, I believe is how you say his last name, but basically the title is how the Red Sox overhauled their hitting development program in 2024. Now, part of this it's like in 2024 so it's like some of these shifts and changes actually happened obviously with bloom out of the realm and out of the picture um so it's not completely fair to be like oh this is just another like actually it's not fair at all to say that this is another like oh look what bloom did well and there's probably some things that they changed that are different than what heim bloom did but if you read through the article it seems like they made some significant hires a little bit before the bloom era they started doing an audit during the second to last season of Bloom being in charge in Boston. Um, again, a lot of the guys that they drafted 
um, during and that are having success now, like a Marcelo Mayer, Christian Campbell, Kyle Teal. Um, again, there's a right, oh, uh, Roman Anthony, like again, a bunch of top 100 prospects. Roman Anthony is number one prospect in all of baseball, according to Baseball America and other outlets. Um, I think Christian Campbell was the minor league hitter of the year. Marcel Mayer is like a top 10 prospect, according to most people. Kyle Teal is top 25. So really impressive position player stuff they built to pull off. Again, some of those guys took extra strides this year when Bloom wasn't there. So it's like how much of that is a residual effect of the things he's done. A lot of his guys are still there. And how much of that is um, the new leadership? That's hard to know. But at the very least, he identified that talent. A lot of it was being developed. So it's not like Mayer and Campbell and Anthony weren't good prospects. And now they are. It's like, oh, wait, they've just taken steps forward. And would that have Bloom there this year? I would tend to believe so. Um, but we'll see. So. I do think there is signs within his time in Tampa signs, definitely within his time with Boston. Um, and then again, just the kind of baseball mind he is and the things he prioritizes where um, it's hard to tell you specifically. It's not like I'm going to sit here and be like, Oh, he's going to like, this is the exact change. He's going to make Walker. This is the exact change. He's going to make with Corman. Um, I don't know. And to be fair, it's hard to know. I mean, you don't really know what's going to happen with any of these guys, right? Sometimes guys come up and struggle for a few years and then they become stars. And sometimes people play really well, players play really well early in their career and then they fall off. And sometimes they're like a legit prospect and then don't work at the major league level. And sometimes they're like a Brendan Donovan type and then they're great at the major league level. So I'm, I'm not here to tell you that like, oh, he will fix Walker specifically. He won't fix Gorman or vice versa or that they're both lost causes. So they're both future stars in the making. I think they have the talent though. And I think he's going to have the resources to really pour into those systems. And so that's where I think his presence will come with helping the young bats develop. Again, we also saw, obviously, the uh, change with Turner Ward. So it'd be interesting to see what hitting coach they hire at the major league level. But I also expect there to be additional roles outside of Brandon Allen's role. But, like, who's the assistant hitting coach? But are, and I mean, maybe he gets promoted, but they'll still have another assistant hitting coach. But do they hire a director of hitting development like Jeff Albert is with the New York Mets after being the the Cardinals hitting coach for so long, just saying. Are they going to do some roles like that? I think so. I think that's part of this process. So um, another question that's kind of a follow-up to that, and I think it's pretty interesting. And it's something I asked Bernie Miklas on Sunday, if you took or um, got a chance to look at that episode yet. Um, or maybe did I? I think I asked him live. I don't know if it was off air, but I think I asked him live on there. Um, yeah, I did. Um, so, Andrew, you don't need to cut that part. But um, I, I asked this question kind of um, in a different way, but I'll get into it anyways. Um, the question was, when the Cardinals rebuild the farm system, will they pay young, the young core to keep it together? So my question to Bernie was, hey, like, to your knowledge or to your belief, like, do you think the Cardinals are going to reinvest this money into the Major League Club later or invest more money into the organization that includes the Major League Club if they're going to take a step back to invest in the minor leagues for right now? Um, or are they going to kind of use this as like a, hey, Bloom was able to maximize our player development and now we don't need to spend as much at the major league level because of it. Now, could they potentially like like long term have less piece like like if the pie, which is what they've talked about, the whole pie the, or have baseball operations is one thing. It's not like do it's like, hey, you have this much for payroll and this much for player development. Like he gives the the pobo or whoever like here's your overall money and you divide it up how you want to. Could more money pieces, more percentage of that pie go toward player development long term and less go to play, in, to play role? I could see that for sure. But I think what we're kind of probably seeing this year is that there is both moving money away from the, um, again, we haven't seen this yet, but it seems like moving money away from payroll toward player development and also less investment overall because of the lack of revenue. So I think this question is asking like once player development is in a good place, revenues are going back up, are they going to reinvest that money back into the major league club? I think Bernie brought up a really good point to say that one of the things that Bill DeWitt um, kind of like mourned on behalf of Rays fans and the Rays organization is the fact that they had such a good model, but they couldn't spend money. And we know that the DeWitts love stars and that they believe that it's important to have stars in St. Louis and that you can't just be a nameless organization where you're like the Rays and you compete every year, but it's like who are the players you're latching on to. I, str I do believe that to the core, the Cardinals will continue to like, especially if they to draft and develop their own star, like they let pool holes go, but like that was a unique situation of a like insane contract that 
I mean, it ended up working out. They didn't bring him back, but maybe maybe they did bring him back. He ends up painting out and being great again. But um, but like they they kept Yachty around every year, right? They they kept Matt Holiday going, or they um they, and they gave him. I think it was their. I mean, he's got the largest free agent contract they've signed to a player so far. Um, after they traded for him at midseason, they kept Adam Weiner, Yadier Molina. Um, I, I think they're going to be the kind of organization that wants to keep those guys around. They traded for the contracts of Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado. So I do think once they develop the core of young guys, it doesn't necessarily mean these are going to be the stars, but then they'll know, oh, like we still lack a middle of the order bat. We've got all the pieces around it. We can go trade for that or go sign that free agency. Or, hey, we've got a lot of really good pitchers, but we need one more guy. We'll go sign that guy instead of patching it with all these veterans on expensive deals, but not necessarily that good of players. Instead, they can have a young core that's cheap, cost-controlled, and then they can invest in other spaces. So I do think that they will pay to keep guys around or to bring guys in. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens exactly with that. Um, I, I'm optimistic that they want to reinvest into the team. Um, I, again, I don't know what that number is. I don't know if it means they'll get into the $200 billion payroll area that many of us would love to see them get to at some point. But again, I think the more important thing is that they spend money wisely then continue to spend more money. But it would be great if they did both. So let's hope for that. Um, before I keep going, let us I want to thank a sponsor of our episode, and it's 314 Sports Cards and Collectibles. Um, 314 is a great organization. Um, they uh, Many of you have gone there already to get your own sports trading, trading cards. Um, they're located at 9640 Olive Boulevard and all of that. They're open 10 to 5 Monday through Friday, 9 to 4 on Saturdays. They buy, sell, and trade all sports cards and Pokemon cards. So they have the newest selections of packs, boxes, and single player cards of local players, stars around the league, and legends from the past. Um, so if you want to go in there and check out any sports cards for yourself, I know Andrew's been in there a lot. I mean, again, many of you have been there, so let them know if you um, swing by and, and heard about them from the podcast. Um, but yeah, go check them out. Um, follow them on Instagram as well. They post a lot of their good deals over there too, so you kind of know what they've got in stock. Um, and then if you go to their link in their bio, they've got a thing where they will um, go live on this platform and you can like live bid on cards too so that's another way to check them out so go check out 314 sports cards okay i'm gonna try and be a little bit quicker with the next few of these so how many home runs at triple a does luke and baker need to hit before he's considered for a right-handed bat at dh first base they have yet to give him a legitimate chance he should have been in the lineup every day in september what was holly thinking why didn't they let him play at triple a rather than let him ride the bench well, I think to your point, how many more AAA home runs does he need to hit to prove that he should be at the major league level? Zero, right? Like it's it's time. Like it doesn't necessarily mean he's a big leaguer. Um, we think he has a big league future at, in some capacity, but putting him back in AAA to keep hitting him, like he's already proven it. So like at this point, might as well have him on the roster, especially because of this. Again, it's a small sample size, so it's not totally fair to him because he only had 27 plate appearances against right-handed hit pitchers and 22 against left-handed pitchers, but. So far, he has clearly been effective against left-handed pitching, and he's been horrific against right-handed pitching. Um, here, yeah, let's start with the uh, the good. Against left-handed pitching, he's slashing 278, 364, 722 slugs. So that's a 1,086 OPS. Awesome. 182 WRC+. Plus. It's awesome. And he's striking out 13.6% of the time. But again, that's 22 plate appearances, so very small sample size. But so far, it's like, hey, he should at least be pretty effective against left-handed pitching, and that's when they would use him a lot. And that's when they needed him roster construction-wise is they needed those right-handed bats. Okay, he got even more plate appearances against right-handed pitching by five, and he slashed 091, 222, 136, good for a 359 OPS and a 13 WRC plus with a 30% strikeout rate. So, so far, the early returns tell me that Luke and Baker is a platoon bat, most likely, against left-handed pitching. And is a DH only, mostly, maybe first base. Not That's a tough player to have on your roster, especially when you had Paul Goldschmidt. I envision next year, Luke and Baker will be getting more of a shot, unless maybe some of the catchers, they utilize some of them at first base more, some other players, but... I would guess we're going to see Alec Burleson as the primary first baseman against right-handed pitching because that's what he hits well against, and he is terrible against left-handed pitching. Luke and Baker as the primary first baseman against left-handed pitching, and he is terrible against right-handed pitching. That's a platoon right there. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't think Ollie was an idiot for not playing him every day because 
frankly, Baker did not show anything to prove that he is good enough against right-handed pitching to play against it. I would have liked to have seen him defensively play at first base more to see what they have in him. But what that tells me is they don't believe in him at first base and they don't like the fact that he played zero. I think, I don't think he ever ended up. I know last year he did a little bit, but I don't think he got a single, um, a single appearance at first base at the major league level this year. And I think what that, uh, maybe he got one. Yeah, he got one. And that's like, but that tells me is they just, I mean, part of it's because they have Paul Goldschmidt, but also part of it's, I don't think they believe in him there. Um, at least not a ton. It doesn't mean they're not complaining there next year, but I think they have their concerns. So, um, again, I don't, I'm not, I think Baker deserved more opportunities, but I don't think it was a travesty. He wasn't playing every day. Um, I do think since they started to know that Paul Goldschmidt was going to be back next year, I wish they were to reduce some of his playing time even more, but whatever. But to that point, again, I think I don't think people are realizing. I don't think some people realize how bad he is against right-handed pitching, and that's the majority of the pitching you face. So these left-handed platoon option or platoon against left-handed pitching, that's great. Um, and we had a follow-up to the Fetty question from last time. They said, um, I'm the one who asked who you wouldn't why you wouldn't keep Fetty. It makes sense what you said, but before you put him on the trade talks, I would offer him two years, 18 million with a third year club option at 11 million. I think Fetty is in the same talent level as Lance Lynn or Kyle Gibson, and he's only 31. That makes sense. I think that's a way that he could pursue it. Um, I definitely wouldn't, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to do something like that. I still think, though, with the position they're in, like, again, I don't think 2025 is a good year for them. 2026 is where you're probably. Like okay, you're hoping to be contending again in like a like a playoff team, and then the 2027, 2028 is where you're wanting to really go off, and it's like okay, well that fits within what that extension range would be, but then he's in his mid 30s at that point, and I just don't know what kind of pitcher Freddie would be. I just think you take the value you've got right now and trust that you're going to continue to develop arms, and that you can go out and sign that guy when you need that guy later. Um, but I do think again, if he's at coming at nine million a year with 11 million option, that's a probably a I mean, that's a bargain for what I think he's actually going to get. So it makes sense. Um, but I just, again, I don't think Fetty would accept that. I think Fetty's going to hit free agency again. Um, so then I would deal him. I just don't see why he would take two years, 18 million, because it's basically what he got this past time. And he it has vastly outperformed it. So um, I think he would take a one year deal, like 18 million before he takes a two year deal at 18 million. But again, like you said, you offer it to him. If he takes it, great. Um but I'd probably just trade him because I don't think he's going to take that. Um, then another question was talking about maybe their way, ability to be competitive next year. It says, let's say you move Contreras to first base, like Goldie, Lynn, Gibson, Walk. Trade Helsley and Arenado for what you get, whatever you can get. Could you keep Gray and actually be a better team next year? Better, uh, better is where it gets like, I've said this a lot of times, or a few times now. I think the range of outcomes for the 2025 Cardinals is wide. Even if they trade a lot of those guys, but especially if they keep some of them, I could see this team being low 70s wins next year and not very competitive at all, obviously, and being a bottom 6 7 team in baseball. Or I could see them winning, what was it? What did they win this year? 82, 83 games? I could see them winning like 83 games again next year with a young core and some of those veterans around them. Um, especially depending on it, what kinds of moves they make this offseason. Are they strictly going to move money off the books and let young guys play? Or are they going to also make some shrewd signings? Again, we're not talking big moves, but are they going to... I mean, maybe on the trade market, they could swing something interesting, but I think for the most part, I'm talking about those under the radar, buy low, or like, oh, there's a market inefficiency here. Our market efficiency here, we can target and we can get really good value here. Like, I think they'll do those kind of things for sure still. Um Trading Helsley makes it a little bit tough because you just lost like an elite closer that really helped you a ton this year. But again, I don't think it's a huge, like team wins wise. I don't think you drop like 10 wins because of that. Um, Arenado, again, he was a valuable player. I think I've been a little too hard on him in terms of like acting like he's been really bad. He's been really bad compared to what expectations are. But he's still a valuable third baseman. So it's not like you're a net positive losing him by any means. You're not. Um, unless some of the young guys step up. But I think, yes, there's a world where they could be could be better. Um, or I guess maybe like they win 83 games, but they're still a better team because they're Pythagorean. I think they're like 74-win team, 75-win team. So like they weren't supposed to win as many games as they did based on the run differential. So maybe they post a better run differential with Gray, Quinn Matthews, Michael McGreevy, 
um, Michaelis, Fetty, um, Tink Hentz makes it at some point, then the lineup is filled with the young bats, and Contreras plays at first base every day, so you get that bat every in there all the time. I think there's a world where they're a competitive baseball team again next year, um, about the same range. Um, again, we just thought the Tigers. Like I don't think any of us thought in May or June or July even that, yeah, and even in August, that any, that they were going to make a run like this. And now they're in the ALCS. So like, again, please do not quote me and say, like, Josh is trying to pump the Cardinals the NLCS bandwagon next year. I'm not. I'm just also saying that we can't for sure say the Cardinals can't make the playoffs next year. Right now, we don't know what they're going to do. And then also, like, I know the, the Tigers have some of the ingredients, but, like, I don't think they're... I mean, I don't know. I'd have to sit down and think about it, but I don't think they're a more talented team than the Cardinals right now. So um, I think they're about in the same range. And look what the Tigers did. So again, not saying the Cardinals are going to do that, but could they be competitive next year? We'll see. But they could also be really bad. So yeah, we need to see more of the offseason first. So um, and then related to that, um, we all know about the big contracts of the front office would love to move on, which we think they want to move on from, but they've been. I think I think they're being kind of honest in that they still are assessing revenues and assessing the desire of some of these guys to stick around or go. So like I think that will influence things. But I think um, he continues to say, but I think it would be interesting to hear who amongst the big co contracts people don't want to move on from, specifically amongst the guys like Arnado, Contreras, Gray. Who would you not want to see go? So I'd love to hear if you're listening. If you made it this far, comment down below. Again, like and subscribe if you made it this far it helps us out a ton. But Comment down below out of here. I'll answer the question too. out of Arenado, Gray, Contreras, and let's throw Helsley in there. Who would you keep and who would you trade? Um, I start with Helsley because it was a complicated one, but actually with all of these, it depends on the return. I don't think except for Arenado, I think that money is worth getting off the books potentially, but I don't think it's like essential. You move on from that. Um, but like with Gray, Contreras and Helsley, I, well, Helsley again. Those, okay, let's go Contreras and Gray. Like, if you're not getting a good return, why deal them? I don't get it. Like, Gray was one of the like. I know the ERA wasn't as good as you'd want it to be this year, but all the underlying stuff says that dude's still really good. Frontline starter again. Sure, maybe not true ace, but like, is he a one A or one B, a two A? Can he pitch in a, the one game wonder game two of a postseason series? Yes, he can. He'd be great. So you keep that kind of guy. And Contreras is one of the best bats in baseball. So why would you just trade him for nothing? Especially when he only makes $18 million a year. That's nothing for an elite bat. So, um, Or nothing for an elite bat who has a free agent contract. So um, Helsley, I'll start. I'll say, so comment down below what you do with Helsley, Arnato, Contreras, and Gray. If I were in charge with the Cardinals, I would try and see if Ryan Helsley liked to be a starting pitcher and convert him to that. Again, I've talked about this before. We can talk about it again. There's a lot of examples around baseball right now of relievers turning to starters, and it works really well. If he's against it, then you trade him. Um, or if you're the Cardinals and you're not going to do that, unless, I don't know, maybe Hunt Bloom would, but assuming the Cardinals aren't going to do it, you trade him. Get peak value right now. No point keeping a closer around. Trade him. Um, Arnado, I lean toward trade um, because I don't, I think he wants to win, and I don't necessarily think he's. I mean, I mean, it seems like he made some shifts toward the end of the year, but in general, I don't know if he's necessarily like the best guy to have around when you're not winning all the time. And so, why not just let him go to LA if that all works out? Um, but if he doesn't want to leave, then I guess you keep him. And um, well, I mean, you can't really not keep him because he has a no trade clause. But if he did, if he wants to stay, then I'm like, okay, sure. Hopefully, he bounce back. Um, and then Contreras and Gray, I'm shopping them. I want to hear offers on them um, because if I, if I, if I believe there's another smart team out there, who's like, Oh yeah, Gray's awesome. I will give you what you need to go get him. Then I'm taking that. They're giving me a haul for him. I mean, a haul like, okay, we're not talking like Juan Soto stuff. Right. But like, if they give you a really, really good trade package and we can talk about that in the future, what that looks like, then I'm trading gray. But if not, then I'm keeping him because he can mentor the unarms and he's a good pitcher. And I don't know, he could be really effective in 2026 when you need him or, if, again, if you're going to be competitive in 2025. And the same with Contreras. Again, doesn't make a lot of money. Um, $18 million is not crazy. It's not crazy money at all. Um, and that bat is just so stinking good. It's a, like He's a top 10 right-handed bat in baseball, left out just based off WRC Plus um, last two years, last three years, actually. 
um, as a catcher, he's definitely the best hitter in baseball. Um, I would move him potentially to first base or at least have him start playing more first base and DH to get that bad lineup as often as possible. Um, especially with Yvonne Herrera, Pedro Pajes, Jimmy Crooks, all those guys coming and catching. But um, yeah, I would shop Grand Contreras, but I'm only trading if I'm like, I have to take this offer. Arenado, I'm trading if he wants to go. If he doesn't want to go, then yeah, you don't, you don't, you can't move him anyways. And then Ryan Healthley, I'm trading because they're not going to make him a starter. So anyways, and lastly, Surely Cardinals ownership doesn't think fans will fall for the cutting payroll bit this offseason, right? The amount of money they save can't possibly go all go towards player development. They're cutting costs, and we all know it at this point. Uh, yes and no, I think. Um, I do think we're not really talking enough. Well, we're kind of talking about it, but I don't think we're totally um, addressing or at least taking into account. Again, it's not my money, and I don't like I'm... I think I'm probably like if there's like a scale of like how upset you get that they don't spend. I used to be far right of like so frustrated. I'd say like I'm trying to understand where it's like it is. It's I mean, again, I think when you own a um, professional sports team, you should also realize that it's like, yes, it's about making money, but it's also like you chose this line of work and like you're trying to appease a fan base. And this is just it's a unique realm of sports and you're supposed to like make it fun, right? Like. I don't I don't know why you wouldn't. Um, so anyway, spend money. I think the fact that they might be losing what is it, seventy five million dollar paycheck from Diamond Sports Group? Like even if, like long term, the pay, um, the subscriber based payment stuff will be better as a business model, most likely. But in the near term, they're going to take a financial loss there. And like, even if they built up a pretty significant subscriber base, which in a rebuild year, I don't know how significant it can be. Like, you're probably making back 20, 30 million, especially with advertisements, maybe 40 million. Like, that's a $30 million loss right there. Um, and plus future revenue that they're not going to be bringing in with that deal. Cause I think I've heard them, I think I've seen the most lucrative years of that deal at this time, which is like over $1 billion is supposed to get from Diamond Sports Group. They haven't even hit yet. That's concerning. Um, and then also, again, the attendance drop, which, again, it's not just ticket sales you lose there, too, because they also have the slash prices on tickets. They're making even less money than the tickets they do sell, but then also they're not making as much money in concessions. There's not many people there. It's so like there's all these different revenues. Again, I'm not trying to defend them. I'm just saying I don't think it's like, oh, we just need to invest money in player events, so we're going to... Like they, that's kind of what they're saying, but I don't think they like are and they I don't I don't hear them as saying, oh, we're only cutting money because we want to invest in payroll. I do think they're just not necessarily coming out and talking about it, which is kind of dumb. I, if I were them, I just own it and be like, hey, we've lost a lot of money and we're going to have to move our books around to do that. Like, I'm like, OK, I get that. I mean, I would I would like you to operate in the red a little bit as like a fan just to be like, hey, prove that you care. Um but yeah, I mean, I don't know how fans are going to react to that. I really don't. And to your point, and I think it's one of the hardest things to know with their desire to go into player development is there's like even the public money dollars on payroll aren't like we can't confirm that they're entirely accurate, but it's a good barometer of how much you're spending on payroll. Like we have no idea how much money any team's player spent on player development. So the Cardinals can be like, oh, we're taking away 40 million from the payroll and investing in player development. It's like, okay, all 40 million, 10 million, 15 million. Where's the rest of that money going? Right. And I don't blame anyone. I'm skeptical. I don't know where it'd be going. Probably back in their pocketbooks or reinvest in some other ways. Like, I don't know. And I don't know how people will digest that. I think for me, again, if, if the reports are true, that they are truly like blown away by bloom, giving him all the resources he needs to pull it off. And if they're so far behind, like I could see it taking significant investment. Um, I don't, I don't think I've seen anyone put out there like how much it actually costs. Like I've seen a lot of people be like, Oh, it's like a Lance Lynn or Kyle Gibson, but it feels like it's one of those things where people just keep saying it. And now everyone believes that's how much it costs. Like, do we actually know how much this is going to like, is this a 40, $50 million investment? I don't know, especially if they're so far behind, it might take that in year one to get it up to speed. I don't, I, Again, I'm not sure. I'm not trying to tell you it is. I'm just spitballing like, or maybe it's $20 million, $15 million. Um, I don't know how fans are going to react to that. I think for me, as long as they're really going to overhaul player development for Bloom, then I'm okay with a year of skipping payroll. Like, 
whatever. I mean, I would like them to do both, and they could do both. They could compete and um, invest in the player development. But I also see, like, okay, like, we've complained for a long time they don't give young players opportunities. So you give them a gap year here, basically. It's like, hey, here's the year where all this young talent that's kind of, like, ready to play in the big leagues, like the Luke and Baker from earlier, you're going to get playing time. And so, JC, you're going to get playing time. Walker, you're going to play every day in right field. And Gorm, you're going to play all the time. Donovan, you're going to play all the time. Newport, you're going to play all the time. Winnie, you're going to play all the time. Herrera, you're going to play all the time. And Scott, and see what you have in them. I think that's interesting. And I think it's helpful long term because, like, for example, like if Walker, if they don't see in Walker this year, then you need to know you need a new plan there. Instead of signing a veteran outfielder that's going to take away playing time, and you're still like next year being like, well, we think we have something Walker, but we're not totally sure. Again, I think just with how bad things are right now, might as well take a year to figure that out than why you're overhaul playing development. But that's just my opinion. I get like totally understand if people are like, hey, they should be competing next year and doing the player development thing. Totally understand that. So um, again, appreciate all the support on the podcast. Like um, the video helps out a ton. Comment down below if you have questions for next time. Comment your thoughts. Who are the guys you would have traded? Who would you have kept? Thoughts on some of my responses below. Um yeah, and we appreciate a ton. Subscribe, share this with people you know. Again, that helps us out a ton. Um, we really appreciate all your support. Go check out the room for sports cards. Um, we'll be back on Sunday with another episode. Um, again, always appreciate the support. See you next time.